guess we should get started. That works. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending another virtual IGPP department seminar. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Elle. I'm Adrian's new postdoc, and I'm working in hydrogeodesy. This week, I'm helping out Tianzin because he's been very hard at work making these virtual seminars happen, which we're all very grateful for. And so hopefully we can spread it around a little bit more so more can join us. Um, just a reminder that next week, actually, we're going to have a seminar host uh, by Tianzin, same time, same virtual place, Tuesdays at 1230. Um, so hopefully we'll see you guys there. This week, we're very excited to host uh, Jeff Framwheeler from Michigan State. Jeff did his BS at Caltech before finishing his graduate work at the University of South Carolina. I was first introduced to Jeff uh, while he was a pre professor of geophysics at Alaska Fairbanks, but he has since become the endowed chair for geology of the solid earth at Michigan State, which is a bit of a mouthful, but very exciting. Uh, Jeff has long been a leader in the field of geodesy, using remote sensing techniques to study a wide range of topics, including tectonics, earthquakes, GIA, and hydrology. And if you don't know Jeff from his research, you might know him since he's served as the chair of a variety of different consortiums during his career, including NAVCO, SIGN, SCEC, GeoPRISMS, TA, and of course is the director of Earthscope, just to name a few. Today, he's going to be talking about separating long-term tectonic motions, surface loading, and other sources of Earth deformation. So with that, I'll let Jeff take it away. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks. So um, yeah, I guess uh, as a professor, I've gotten to do all sorts of these lecturing to my webcam. Uh, so hopefully this will uh, work pretty well. Um, and uh, I'm also hoping my dog will remain uh, quiet uh, uh, until the end of the talk. So, so far, so good. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, uh, if you look at the background behind me, the virtual background behind my little talking head there, uh, that is actually a part of the Michigan State campus. Uh, since we can bend time, uh, space, we might as well bend time and uh, pretend that it's fall uh, in Michigan. Uh, and uh, in the main screen, of course, it's not Michigan because it has topography. Uh, so this is Denali, it's the highest point in uh, North America. So I'm gonna talk really about uh, a few examples of um, separating multiple sources of deformation, uh, mostly long-term tectonic motion, surface loading, and, uh, and uh, others. So uh, I'll show you uh, just a very brief uh, sort of example of some GPS time series. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with this, so this will be pretty brief. Um, and I'll, I'll focus on three examples. The first one is a combination of block motion and subduction strain. So uh, basically, where the overriding plate is moving, or at least the portion of the overriding plate that's relevant, is moving relative to uh, the North American plate. Um, second example is post-seismic deformation and tectonic motions, uh, seeing how we can separate uh, uh, tectonic motions well back from the Alaska subduction zone from uh, far-reaching post-seismic deformation. And then I'll show you an example of glacial isostatic adjustment across the North American plate. And depending on time, I've got a few slides that get at another sort of issue of some of the loading deformation, uh, but we'll see whether there's time to, to get into that. Um, so uh, I'll be, the first two examples are from Alaska. And in fact, most of the data we've taken from Alaska are campaign measurements. And so they're done something like uh, this. This is a, um, one of my favorite little GPS sites uh, in the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, you can see a shiny little thing, which is the survey disk. And uh, we have a device called a spike mount, which is designed to uh, uh, center the antenna exactly over the disk with a known height. And uh, so basically, we would come uh, once every year, once every other year or so, uh, set up our instrument over the, the disk, get a position, uh, and do that over a period of years to uh, measure how things are moving. Uh, of course, we also today make uh, increasing use of continuous GPS uh, sites. This is another one from uh, north of the Alaska Range in Alaska. Uh, so this is a short braced monument, as we call it. The antenna is in inside the dome. Uh, and so this uh, antenna is fixed in place and gives us a position measurement on a daily basis, uh, in, in this case, for uh, well over a decade, about 15 years now. Um, here are examples of what some time series look like. Uh, the one on the left is from Chirikoff Island, which is an island off of the coast of the Alaska Peninsula. Um, it's one that's rather uh, linear in time. 
Uh, I've just given the rates here, the average rate of motion or other key uh, bit of information in the large text, so you don't need to try to worry about reading the small print uh, here. One of the things interesting about this particular site is it subsides at a, on the order of a centimeter per year, and that's because it's so far out over the locked part of the subduction zone that it's actually subsiding interseismically and presumably would uplift uh, in the event of an earthquake. Uh, the um, uh, time series on the right is from southeast Alaska. It's a site called Eldred Rock. Um, there was an earthquake uh, relatively distant. It was a couple hundred kilometers away, about a magnitude seven and a half strike slip event. And that produced a small offset that you can see here, but no really discernible change in horizontal trend. There is actually a very small uh, horizontal post seismic signal. But the main thing you see in this particular uh, case is in the vertical. So first of all, the site is uplifting at a very high rate, uh, about two centimeters per year, and it has about a 30 millimeter per or sorry, 30 millimeter peak to peak seasonal um, uh, cycle uh, in it. Essentially, an annual cycle that turns out to be related to this to the accumulation and melting of snow on the surrounding uh, uh, ground. So the site goes up and down a few centimeters each year. Um, this is an example of a great earthquake. So this is the Mizusawa site in Japan from uh, the Tohoku earthquake. Uh, you can see a little earthquake, which was just a magnitude seven or something like that. And then of course the big one and, uh, and then a beautiful post seismic transient. Um, there are error bars on these things, but this particular time series, the displacements are so big, you can't see the error bars um, and so on. So this just gives you some examples. and. Uh, in, depending on the study, we may be looking at the linear part of a time series, or we may be looking at, at uh, the offsets, or we may be able to be, be looking at the uh, nonlinear uh, variations. So a typical problem we have is that um, we can't completely isolate what's going on um, at, at a given uh, region uh, to a single process. There's quite often multiple processes that are active at the same time that contribute to what we observe. And so uh, what we have to do is attempt to still uh, find a way to isolate uh, whatever it is we're trying to look at. So for example, uh, we might have, um, as I'll show you in the first example, uh, we have uh, motion of the overriding plate um, relative to the, the core of the North American plate. And then we also have subduction strain. So, so, so two things. So the ideal way is to find some data that are mainly sensitive to only one process. And that might be a subset in space or a subset in time. Uh, and if we can do that, we may be able to isolate one process, model that, remove it, and, and look at what's left. Uh, but a typical problem is that we'll have multiple processes we have to model together, and then we have to explore the trade-offs. Uh, between those processes. And so I'll mention uh, uh, some examples of how that works uh, as I go through my examples. So I'll show you, first of all, most a couple of examples from Alaska. And uh, one of them, uh, the first one is going to be along the Alaska Peninsula. Um, and the second one will be actually uh, well inboard of the uh, subduction zone in Western Alaska. And uh, on the Alaska Peninsula, the issue here is that uh, it turns out that all, pretty much all of Alaska is moving relative to this, the stable part of the North American plate. So when we have subduction here, we're going to have some strain associated with whatever's happening on the subduction interface, but we also have motion of the overriding plate uh, relative to North America. And so we have to untangle those two. And uh, here uh, it's more of an issue of uh, post seismic deformation following the 1964 earthquake, which occurred over here, and still affects uh, sites uh, back here uh, today. So we'll go through those examples. So first of all, since uh, the first example involves a subduction zone, uh, I'll just show you a simple uh, model of deformation at a subduction zone. And so uh, this is the, the classic backslip model or slip deficit model, which dates back to Jim Savage in the early 1980s. So on the bottom here, we have a cross section of a subduction zone. And the red part of the interface we're going to assume is locked. That is, it is stuck as a result of friction and not, and not moving. And then below that, we're just going to assume that the interface is creeping. And so in this very simple model, things are either completely locked, that is not moving at all, or completely creeping, that is moving at the plate uh, tectonic uh, rate. And, um, and so uh, the way uh, Savage showed how we calculate this, and what we do is we basically take the deformation due to continuous creep on the entire interface, 
and then subtract out the deformation due to uh, slip on the lock part. And if you do that superposition, you can get a, uh, a slip condition that is zero slip in the locked part and uh, plate motion on the creeping part. And basically it turns out that um, in the subduction zone case, Savage argued that the deformation is going to be essentially entirely due to the, uh, what we call the backslip or the, the, uh, the slip that is not happening um, on the locked part. And that's what uh, is calculated here using a simple elastic uh, dislocation model. So the red curve is the horizontal uh, velocities predicted, the blue is the vertical. Uh, in the vertical, there's an uplift peak, which is uh, out at, or centered over the down dip end of the locked zone, that is the locked to creeping transition. And there's actually a region of subsidence, which is out, well out over the locked zone. So sites um, offshore or on islands offshore might actually see that subsidence, um, depending on location. In the horizontal, we expect to see high velocities relative to the overriding plate uh, for sites that are out over the lock zone, and then this gradient. And the gradient, again, is centered over this lock to creeping transition. And then finally, the little kink you see in the horizontal, that's actually simply because we assumed it went from fully locked to fully creeping. If you just make that a gradual transition, this kink goes away and you get a smoother curve. But the bottom line is what we expect to see is high velocities out uh, closer to the trench and then a, a gradient of um, velocity in the direction of plate convergence uh, as we move uh, back. Um, and so this is what that looks like in map view. Uh, I've complicated things a little bit and that I've put um, a heterogeneous model. So here we have a large locked region. Here we have a smaller locked region, and in between uh, and to the side here, we have regions that are assumed to be creeping entirely. And then the arrows show the predictions of uh, the uh, backslip model uh, for uh, deformation. And so it's quite easy to see if you picked any uh, distance you like away from the trench, that the, the vectors here are all larger than the ones over there, and those are larger than the ones in the middle. So just to first order the, the the velocities tell us something about how much of this interface is, is, uh, is locked and how much of the interface is creeping. Uh, and also the strain uh, that we see here is larger than the strain that we see over here. So, so both the velocities themselves or the strains uh, both tell us uh, information about how much of the uh, uh, patch is locked. Now in this particular case, I've locked everything out to the trench, but uh, unless we have sites out here, close to the trench, we don't really actually get a very clear picture of what's happening there. So whenever we do models, we're almost always assuming whatever happens out near the trench. It turns out not to have very much effect on our sites uh, on land. All right, so let me show you an example from the Alaska Peninsula. And here the green vectors are the observations. And uh, there are a couple of features that you can see. Uh, first of all, if we start over on this part of the figure, you can see the very large amount of contractional strain uh, on the overriding plate. Uh, and, and so that is exactly what uh, we were looking at on the map view uh, picture. But there's another thing that's different, and you can see this rotation of vectors uh, that's present uh, all the way uh, through here. And then finally, in this corner, um, everything is more or less moving as a unit. That is, all of these vectors within error look to be about the same uh, as each other. And uh, they're moving in a trench parallel direction. So. Um, what we're actually seeing here is a, it turns out to be a very simple superposition in that the observation uh, shown in blue in the little inset is really just a combination of a uh, constant uh, velocity of the whole uh, arc relative to the North American plate plus a subduction strain signal that is variable in space. So for example, here where we're way out over the locked zone, the subduction strain component is large and so we get vectors that are parallel to the plate convergence. But uh, as we move away, that subduction strain component gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so if you shrink this vector, eventually you start getting things that look like the arc velocity, which is more or less what that uh, looks like. Um, the red vectors here are just the vertical, but I'm not really going to talk about those uh, uh, here. So, uh, so this is the same, uh, basically the same data with a very small correction added to it for uh, post seismic deformation. It, it's, it's at the millimeter per year level, so it doesn't really do very much. And what I've shown now in, in gray are the, uh, the block motion estimates that we uh, determined 
in uh, a paper with uh, my former student, Sean Sean Lee, a couple of years ago. So that's, uh, that's the block motion. And what you can see is the block motion is essentially equal to the observations over in this corner. Uh, but here we see something uh, different. And if I simply subtract out the block motion, you can now see how the, the observations change. So subtracting out the block motion, these vectors go to zero. Um, all the rest of them are now essentially in the direction of plate motion. The only exception is actually here, and that's a volcano. So this is a Benjaminov volcano, and there's a little bit of a radial outward pattern associated with the volcano. But other than that, now essentially all of the vectors are in the direction of plate motion once we've removed that constant uh, block motion. Uh, so if we uh, uh, do an inversion uh, here where we, we can either do it where we estimate the block motion as well as the, the uh, coupling on the interface. In this particular one, we fix the block motion uh, and estimated uh, basically the slip deficit on the interface. Um, uh, we got this model, which is from Lee and Frymuller 2018. Uh, and essentially in the western end uh, edge of the study area, what we find is the interface is almost purely locked, or sorry, almost purely creeping. That is, there's no locked zone. At the eastern end, there's a very wide locked zone, and then it gets uh, smaller uh, uh, as we go uh, from east to west. Uh, and we can look at that. Uh, these are profiles through each of these, uh, basically each of these segments. Um, so the strongly locked region has a, this is a locking fraction. So this would be essentially the fraction of plate motion uh, rate that is uh, not happening. This is the slip deficit, um, which is uh, very high in this zone, uh, sort of intermediate, sort of weak, and then eventually essentially dominated by creep. So this uh, slip deficit is kind of like uh, putting money in the bank to take it out uh, later. Um, the slip deficit is essentially storing uh, uh, energy uh, in the form of strain energy uh, within the, the lithosphere and surrounding area that eventually gets released in, in earthquakes. So uh, the big earthquakes have happened in the areas that had the larger uh, slip deficit. Um, okay, so, so again, a key factor here is is that um, we had this uh, sort of tectonic long-term motion, which turned out to be close to arc parallel. And then we had a, uh, a subduction signal, which turns out to be close to arc normal. Um, the reason we were able to separate those is actually because we had this region here where the subduction signal essentially goes to zero. And we could see that because there was no strain whatsoever in the overriding plate. Whereas everywhere else, you see a su substantial uh, strain across uh, the Alaska Peninsula. And so that, that was really important in that without that, we would have actually had a huge trade-off between the block motion and the subduction uh, uh, strain component. But the fact that we had this region where the, the, um, the one of the signals, the subduction strain, was essentially absent um, allowed us to actually uh, constrain the, those and separate those two signals much more effectively. So we'll take a look a little bit farther along strike. So this is the region I was showing you before. Um, and uh, what I want to show you here is how much that sort of rigid like block motion may extend uh, farther out into the Aleutian uh, arc itself. So again, the blue or sorry, the green are the observations and the gray are the uh, uh, peninsula block motions. So we have uh, data mostly from volcanoes further out the arc. But if I subtract out the block motion, uh, this is what we get. This is a Westall volcano. So we go from something that's a little harder to interpret to something that is a very nice radial pattern associated with the volcano. Akatan volcano actually has a bit of an asymmetric pattern. It's rather interesting. And these sites over here around uh, Dutch Harbor uh, and Makushin go essentially to, uh, to zero. So they are moving in a way that is essentially consistent with this peninsula block uh, motion that we uh, found uh, further uh, up. And so in fact, we can actually, as it turns out, constrain the peninsula block motion with this region, with the area around Dutch Harbor. And then in fact, even as far out to Atka in the central Aleutians appears to follow uh, the same, uh, essentially the same uh, pole of rotation, uh, same rigid block motion uh, for that region. All right, let me move on to uh, the 1964 uh, post-seismic deformation case. Um, so, uh, so now we're uh, actually moving back up into the sort of main uh, body of Alaska. 
and uh, we'll look at the uh, effects of uh, post seismic deformation from the 1964 earthquake. Um, this slide just shows some of the data and models, or this is actually mostly the data here on the left. Um, so uh, these are um, post seismic, cumulative post seismic uplift measurements. Um, and in Kodiak Island, these were done by repeating measurements of tidal benchmarks about 30 years apart. So essentially using the ocean as a, uh, as a reference. Uh, and then on the Kenai Peninsula, these were done by repeating leveling surveys with GPS uh, and uh, correcting for uh, geoid model. So uh, what we observed was up to on the order of a meter of post seismic uplift after 1964 concentrated in this band. Here is the rupture zone, so the uplift is concentrated just a little bit down dip at the down dip end of the rupture zone, um, which turns out to be dominated by afterslip uh, is the main signal there. The inset shows tide gauge data, and I'll just highlight Kodiak uh, over here. Uh, the Kodiak tide gauge shows a very nice uh, post seismic uh, transient, uh, very, very rapid uh, uplift, uh, immediately after the earthquake, slowing down uh, substantially as time uh, went on. The figure on the right shows the, the portion of the uplift signal that is actually due to viscoelastic relaxation. And so this comes from Suito and Freimuller, 2009. And uh, it's, it's in centimeters. So basically, most of the, of the vertical signals that we observed here are not due to viscoelastic relaxation. And so that fact allowed us to separate afterslip and viscoelastic relaxation. So again, a very common problem in post seismic studies is the need to actually separate these multiple mechanisms. We were able to do that because this vertical data set was only very weakly sensitive to the viscoelastic signal and was very, very sensitive to the afterslip signal. So uh, th this allowed us to put together a post seismic model. I'm not going to say more about the post seismic model because what I want to focus on now is really the longer um, wavelength effects of the post seismic deformation. So here, um, before I get to that, uh, I'll show you the observations. So in green, again, are the data. The red are the post seismic um, uh, velocity predictions evaluated in the early 2000s. So that more or less corresponds with the, the uh, time period of the data. And, uh, and so the horizontal present day uh, post seismic motions are towards the trench. Um, and uh, essentially, you can see this trenchward motion uh, across a broad region here, and that trenchward motion is, is again, dominated by post-seismic deformation. So we, we use data from farther back to actually optimize the post-seismic model. Um, and um, now I want to look a little bit farther uh, back. So here we were just looking at a zoom in of this region right here, which was relatively near field. Um, if we go uh, farther back to Western Alaska, uh, the white vectors show the predictions of, it's actually a combination of two models. One is that 1964 viscoelastic model. The second is a small horizontal correction for glacial isostatic adjustment. And this is in particular the GIA due to post Little Ice Age uh, ice loss, mostly in southeastern and southern Alaska. So it only contributes uh, a fraction of the, of the, of the, uh, um, of the signal, uh, but it turns out to be uh, actually add constructively with the post seismic deformation signal. So um, the scale here is five millimeters per year. Um, I, I don't think I mentioned it, but in the Cook Inlet area here, the post seismic signal reaches about 15 millimeters per year. It's still about 10 millimeters per year here, maybe five millimeters per year in this part of Western Alaska and two to three millimeters per year uh, farther into Northwest Alaska. So there's, um, you know, at the millimeter per year level, the post seismic deformation signal extends really uh, across almost all of Alaska. Um, so now what we're going to look at are uh, data that we collected from Western Alaska and from Far Eastern Russia. And we'll look at the velocities uh, as they stand and also how this post seismic deformation essentially masks the, the actual tectonic signature. Uh, that are present in the in the data. Even though this isn't a very big signal, it's big enough to actually kind of hide the post seismic or uh, hide the actual tectonic signal. So uh, what we see here are on the left, and the right is just a blow up. So it's the same data, but but I've zoomed in on this uh, portion here. Uh, again, the green vectors with error ellipses; those are the observations, and then the smaller red ones 
are uh, the post seismic model predictions. So um, what you can see is that across uh, this section of uh, sort of Western Alaska, the post seismic model predictions are actually comparable to the GPS observations in terms of magnitude, but they're in a different direction. And um, I'll show you in a moment what happens if we remove the post seismic model. Uh, again, I just want to highlight if you get close in, the post seismic correction is actually bigger than the data. If you get in this sort of intermediate range, which is maybe 500 kilometers inland from the trench, uh, the post seismic uh, uh, model uh, prediction is actually comparable to the data. And then in the far field, when you get out to close to 1,000 kilometers away, uh, the post seismic model prediction is nearly zero uh, and has very little effect on the data. So this shows now a map of the data. Uh, uh, across, uh, including a significant chunk of uh, Chukotka in uh, the Russian Far East. Uh, these are relative to North America. The scale here is five millimeters per year, so we're dealing mostly with pretty small uh, uh, motions. And what I've done for clarity is I've removed all of the sites uh, from the subduction zone that have really big velocities. So we, we're not going to look at those. We're going to look at the ones that are a bit farther away. Um, so these are the velocities as we measure them relative to the North American plate. If we subtract out the post seismic model, this is what we get. So I'll kind of go back and forth a few times and you can see with your eye how much um, uh, the pattern of velocities change. If you just look at the observations, you see this again rotational, clockwise rotational pattern that almost looks like a single rigid block, although it's a little bit weird here and that there's kind of sites not too far apart where the velocities are almost at right angles to each other. Um, but if we subtract the post seismic model, what we see is actually a fairly coherent pattern where all of these sites are moving uh, to the southeast. Uh, and then essentially all of these are moving uh, more or less as a block. Uh, there's not a lot of relative motion between these sites. And they're moving. Uh, um, essentially to the, um, sorry, they're moving to the southeast, these guys are moving to the southwest. Um, the other thing that becomes clear when we look at this uh, pattern is um, basically everything south of this line here, which is the Kaltag fault, is actually moving um, to the southwest relative to the North American plate. So this is essentially a portion of Alaska that is escaping. It is being squeezed out of the uh, more collisional tectonic regime in uh, uh, south central Alaska and being sort of squeezed out over the Bering Sea and uh, the Aleutian Arc. So, so again, with, without the, the post seismic deformation essentially hid that sharp change, when we remove the post seismic deformation, we can very clearly see the boundary between the, the region that is essentially uh, involved in this tectonic escape and then a region here which is moving much more slowly relative to the North American plate. Uh, and uh, the next figure, I'm just going to fit a, 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 an Euler pole to uh, these data here um, and remove that. If I remove that rotation, now um, I would get a pole located somewhere around Kamchatka for this Chukotka Arctic bearing plate. And, um, and these, these uh, uh, residuals are all fairly close to zero. So essentially, there's not a lot of relative motion uh, um, across the Bering Strait on this part. And uh, you can see very clearly that everything else on the other side of the red line is moving substantially relative to this Chukotka Arctic Bering Block. So this gives us a way to isolate one of these very slow moving, um, very slow moving uh, 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 inland uh, tectonic uh, blocks. And so this was a, a, an initial uh, inversion that we did in the preparation of putting together, I'll skip the details here for the numbers, um, but in, in preparation for a, a model that Julie Elliott and I put together uh, as a block model, this is, it's still in press because there's some formatting issues where, that uh, Julie is trying to deal with with AGU, um, but uh, it's a JGR paper that's still on the papers, uh, early view papers. And uh, it's a tectonic block model for all of Alaska. So it's the first time that we actually were able to make a tectonic block model for all of Alaska. So this is essentially that uh, 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 Seward Peninsula. In, 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 the, in the paper, we didn't include the data from Chukotka uh, over there. And uh, we actually can divide the region. Uh, here's the Kaltag Fault, and this is the, the Western Denali Fault. So we can essentially divide 
um, this part of Western Alaska into probably a couple of distinct blocks that do move uh, uh, differently from each other. Uh, the motions that you're seeing here are the predicted block motions. Uh, so of course the observations are the block motions plus the elastic strain associated with all of the locked faults. Uh, this just shows the block motion component uh, of uh, those motions. Uh, so again, what allowed us to uh, separate out um, the fact that we had a, a, a sort of a, a boundary here uh, between a, a, a region that was essentially tectonically escaping and a region that was not uh, was uh, uh, having a post-seismic model that was good enough to remove um, this, uh, this signal that was essentially masking the real uh, tectonic uh, uh, signature. All right, so uh, the last example, uh, I'm going to switch to uh, the lower 48 states, and in particular, Eastern North America. And so in Eastern North America, the, the main signal that uh, we observe in the both the vertical and the horizontal, actually, uh, is glacial isostatic adjustment. And so uh, this figure shows the ICE 6G model uh, of Peltier. So this is a GI, one GIA model. Um, the arrows don't have a marked scale, but if you look at this region here, these largest arrows are about one millimeter per year. So essentially what, what the GIA model predicts is about one to one and a half millimeters per year of shortening, uh, more or less north-south across the eastern United States. And that shortening is associated with, again, the GIA. So uh, the, um, the red contours are uplift. And so uh, in the I6G model, there are three distinct domes uh, of uplift. Uh, one, uh, two of them around Hudson's Bay and one of them over to the west of Hudson's Bay. Um, and so basically this region was under the ice. It is now uplifting. Uh, the lower 48 states were um, part of the forebulge. They were uplifted as part of the forebulge when the glacier, uh, when the ice sheet was sitting over Canada. Now that the ice sheet is gone, the forebulge is collapsing. And so essentially what we observe in the GIA signal is that um, outside of the forebulge, everything moves back in towards the load center. And then uh, within, uh, basically within the forebulge, uh, it's a more complicated pattern, but uh, often moves outward uh, relative to the load center. So what we're going to do is take a look at GPS data from uh, the eastern part of North America and look at how well uh, the GIA model and other signals are reflected in those uh, data. Okay, one other thing that needs to be uh, dealt with when we are dealing with very, very small motions is the possibility of a frame origin bias. And so this figure um, uh, comes from Kogan and Steblov, 2008. Um, and it was one of the first papers that sort of highlighted this issue. Um, it shows a very large uh, frame origin bias, five millimeters per year, but of course you can just rescale this if you want. If you think it might be smaller, which it certainly is, uh, the vectors would simply just change the label here. Um, and so uh, what they noted is that if, so we, we derive our velocities in the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. And every effort is made to ensure that this reference frame is geocentric. That is, that the origin of the reference frame agrees with the geocenter of the Earth. That turns out to be very hard to do. And in fact, one of the reasons it's hard to do is because the, the, um, the true geocentric constraints mostly come from satellite laser ranging. Uh, not from GPS. GPS has lots of sites around the world. Satellite laser ranging has less than 25. And satellite laser ranging has a terrible geometry, uh, observing geometry. But um, uh, SLR is, is actually much more sensitive to the geocenter uh, than GPS, um, lacking some biases like uh, tropo uh, tropospheric, um, well, not tropospheric delays, but the antenna phase center models in particular. So there is a possibility that our reference frame is not truly geocentric. And if our reference frame has a small velocity relative to the geocenter, that actually maps into um, uh, strains on the surface of the Earth. And so that's what this figure shows here, is that if, if, the, um, if the geocenter uh, is, or if the reference frame is moving uh, along the spin axis relative to the geocenter, 
um, that would induce a uh, z component uh, velocity a bias to every site. And uh, for a site at the equator, that would be a horizontal northward or southward motion. For a site at the pole, that would be a vertical uh, motion. And so uh, basically, a, um, what that means is that if we actually um, have an error in our reference frame or in any correction model that we apply to our data, um, we can actually induce an apparent strain uh, on the surface of the Earth. And it's a very long wavelength signal. Uh, and so basically, that would be associated with the frame origin bias. Um, Donald Argus suggested uh, about a half a millimeter per year bias in ITRF uh, 2008, um, uh, mostly along the spin axis. So that is mostly along the z-axis uh, would be the, uh, the bias. So, um, so this is not a very big uh, effect, but um, when you're dealing with millimeter per year signals, a 0.5 millimeter per year bias would be a big deal. So, um, so what we're going to do uh, now is we're going to test models for North American plate rigidity uh, with various models for internal deformation removed. So I'll consider the I6G GIA model and also this frame origin bias. And so what we'll do is we'll remove different combinations of these models from the data, evaluate the models based on misfit and also um, uh, residual, uh, basically residual, uh, how, how many sites can be, um, can actually be fit by a rigid plate model. So again, GIA produces a deformation of the plate, even in the tectonically stable part of the plate, and the frame origin bias also produces a deformation uh, across the plate. So, um, so if the plate is rigid, we should be able to find a rigid plate model that fits the data well if we can remove these biases uh, correctly. So we'll test that out. Uh, and so here are some observations. The panel on the left is kind of a larger scale. The panel on the right is a blow up of the southeastern United States. Um, and so uh, what we observe in general in the velocities uh, uh, are northward motions uh, in Mexico um, that get smaller and smaller as we get up to Canada and maybe southward motions as we get into Canada. Um, so the red is I6G and the, the blue is uh, the GPS observation. So there's not a perfect match, certainly, between these models, but they, there's a lot of resemblance to each other. Um, so let's look a little more systematically at um, what happens when we remove uh, these models. So what we'll do is we'll, first of all, take ITRF velocities by themselves. We had 300 sites across eastern North America. and um, if we uh, fit a rigid plate model to all 300 sites, we get a WRMS of almost five millimeters per year, which is pretty terrible. Um, and uh, if we uh, remove the geocenter, we get a much smaller effect. If we actually remove uh, the geocenter bias and I6G, we get a, an even smaller uh, error. Um, we also did an outlier uh, detection, and so, um, the outlier detection was essentially throwing out uh, all sites, an iterative process, throw at any site with a three sigma uh, residual, and then reinvert. Um, what we found if we did that is we can get pretty small WRMS values, but, um, but unless we remove both of those signals, the geocenter and the, or the frame origin and I6G, we have to throw out a lot of the data. So for example, if we throw out half the sites, uh, without making any corrections, we can come up with a rigid plate model that fits reasonably well. Um, none of these uh, poles are radically different, but they're all subtly different. And uh, the, the best model is, uh, is ultimately this one, where we remove a, a frame origin correction of a half millimeter per year based on Argus's result, plus removing the I6G uh, model. And uh, what we find then is that the outliers that are remaining in there are actually randomly distributed in space. Whereas in all the other cases, the outliers that were rejected were not randomly distributed in space. Okay, so this was from a paper that was published uh, last year, uh, Ding and others. Um, and uh, so these are the residuals and um, the, um, the uh, blue triangles are the, the outliers that were rejected. So again, they're pretty randomly distributed, except for these, which I would say are probably systematic. Um, and these are uh, more or less near the former ice margin, so they probably reflect uh, some issues in the, um, in the uh, uh, ice model itself. Um, 
And then uh, finally, in the blow up of the southeast, you can see there's a reasonable number of residuals, but that's because these are all core sites that were set up by departments of transportation for uh, land surveyors. So, um, you know, the stability of, of all of these sites is not necessarily guaranteed. They were not built to our standards, but the bottom line is the great majority of them are actually uh, pretty good sites and give reliable results. Uh, and then this just shows a blow up of uh, residuals. I've included the ones that were um, uh, 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 included. These also had some pretty large vertical residuals. So I think there's some localized um, uh, groundwater withdrawal uh, signals uh, that are probably affecting some of the sites in the data. All right, the other thing we can do then is we can take a look at our velocities and compare them to the GIA model and see, um, uh, see how the model performs. And so, uh, uh, we'll look at some profiles and um, uh, so for example this profile uh, C is just a band along the coast uh, and so the colored dots are the GPS sites and you can see the gray uh, dots which are the model predictions. So along the coast um, there are actually quite a few sites that are um, below the model prediction and that's actually uh, we think um, because of groundwater uh, extraction. So uh, previous work had suggested that that was true. Uh, uh, but um, I think if we look at other, uh, for example, um, profile D uh, runs orthogonal uh, across there. What we see is that uh, this is actually true um, pretty systematically. It's not just at the coast that the GIA model uh, under predicts uh, the data. So uh, what we find is that in general, the I6G model performs reasonably well, but it underpredicts the uh, subsidence in the four bulge. Um, and that probably does reflect a, um, an issue uh, with the model. Um, the last comparison that we made here was with uh, um, sea level uh, observations. And so many of these GPS sites are co located or nearly co located with tide gauges. And um, and so we can take the vertical motions with GPS, we can take the tide gauge, which measures ocean surface relative to land, and we can take sea surface height anomalies, which are measured by altimetry. And uh, if all of these data are consistent, we, we should basically get um, global average sea level rise plus, um, um, you know, plus these spatial variations, either if, it, if it's a spatial variation in the ocean, it should be accounted for by the, the sea surface height. If it's a spatial variation in the vertical land motion, it should be accounted for in the GPS. And so we should get um, essentially uh, a values that would agree with, um, with uh, sort of global average sea level rise. And so the blue are just the, the GPS uh, uh, subsidence rates. They're all negative for the most part across the, the mid-Atlantic region. If we take the GPS plus the tide gauge minus the sea surface height, we get the black uh, um, ones. And so the, the red are just GPS tide gauge without correcting for sea surface height. And it's pretty noisy, but uh, we do end up getting uh, recovering an average rate that uh, is in pretty good agreement with what the tide gauges would uh, give as a, a global average sea level rise over the tide gauge period. So a little less than two millimeters per year. Um, if we did not make our geocenter corrections, so our GPS velocities here are not corrected in this figure for GIA, but they are corrected for the geocenter. Um, if we didn't correct for the geocenter, we would end up with a too slow rate of global average sea level rise. So we think the geocenter correction is actually improving our agreement between the GPS and the tide gauges. Okay, the last thing I want to look at here um, that's uh, relevant to this is, um, we estimated in that process uh, the, um, an angular velocity for the North American plate. And I've now evaluated our model for North America and compared it with another model, uh, the Giad Bell model from uh, Donald Argus. Um, and I, I did so on a um, not uniform set of sites. So the reason you don't see much from California is because, sorry that I've got a dog here uh, nudging my mouse, uh, uh, arm, which is um, her way of getting my attention. Uh, anyway, um, the reason you don't see much in California is I just didn't happen to compute it there. Uh, but this uh, shows our estimate of the North American uh, uh, plate motion minus the Giadvel, uh, and the scale is about here is a millimeter per year. So across the lower 48, these two models are in very, very good agreement. 
but you can see systematic rotational differences that reach about a half a millimeter per year uh, in the eastern United States. Uh, and they get bigger when you go over to Alaska. So, so these are just basically the difference between two different North American models. And uh, in this particular case, the differences are relatively small. Um, however, another um, uh, uh, commonly used um, North America model is NA12, which Jeff Blewett uh, derived a few years ago. Um, so NA12 was actually two different things. Um, there was, first of all, a regional reference frame. That is a velocity model that you could use to align solutions with a regional frame. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with the velocity model. Uh, but then also a, um, uh, an estimate of the North American plate motion. And uh, what Jeff did, actually, is he used data from just the southeastern United States to estimate the rigid plate motion. But that's actually where the GIA model shows there is a strain. And so that biased the plate model. So some of the PBO products, for example, are in this NA12 reference frame. The scale of the difference between our estimate and NA12 is here two millimeters per year. So really, it's at the two millimeter per year difference level at California. That's actually big enough to matter for some tectonic things. And the difference between the two frames is up to like five or six millimeters per year in Alaska. And in this particular case, I, I can pretty much say the problem is NA12 because um, if, it wouldn't really make very much sense if we uh, um, uh, used NA12 velocities for, uh, for Alaska. But uh, for other parts, the, the difference is a whole lot smaller. So again, um, anytime we're doing something, if we're doing a tectonic problem in, in California, we're trying to remove North America if there's any sort of issue in how we define North America, that actually maps into uh, what we're uh, trying to do. Um, I think I don't have uh, time for these last couple slides, so I'm going to skip uh, this uh, last few slides. I'll go straight to the conclusions. Um, uh, okay, so basically the conclusions are uh, that multiple deformation processes are commonly mixed together in our data. And, uh, and so when that's the case, we have to separate them somehow. And uh, again, if the ideal case is to find a subset of data that isolates one single process. The examples I showed you were subsets in time, uh, sorry, subsets in space, or uh, as I mentioned in talking about the 1964 model, it was vertical versus horizontal um, allowed a subset in direction and component. Um, or a sequential process of model improvement. And so, you know, we often have to do ultimately some degree of a sequential process of model improvement, removing one model for something to isolate the effects that remain. Uh, and then sometimes we actually have to iterate around this, this loop a few times uh, before we truly get it right. Uh, ultimately, most of our data are include signals from long-term tectonics, from earthquake cycle, and from surface loading. Uh, and we ultimately need to model all of these uh, data and remove those effects uh, from the data before, uh, you know, to truly um, get at the parts that we are trying to uh, determine. So I'll go ahead and end there, and um, that should leave some time for uh, some questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute your mic, or if you want to just drop it in the chat, we can read it for you. Ignacio, you raised your hand. Yeah. I have a question. <laughs> yeah. I start to get used to use this, these icons. <laughs> More polite. So, yep. Thank you very much for the for the talk. Very interesting and clear. So, I have a question related with the, with the measurement, with the coastal measurements that you have in one of the slides. Here we are, currently we are, we are running some experiments using the, the ENSS uh, instrument in order to measure sea levels. Um, and of course we have, there are some limitations and actually my work is basically trying to, to see what is the accuracy of that and, and if it is useful, for example, to measure sea level rise or or other long-term effects, which seems right. to be to be to be good, provided some conditions to the instrument. So the question is, 
what is the quality of those instruments and specifically what is the frequent the sampling frequency of the of the ENSS instrument that you you have there because I would think that it's possible to do the the measurement of the of the sea level just using the the, the ENSS and not the tight gauges, which is very expensive, actually. Yeah, it should be possible. I mean, so, so um, let's see, one thing not reflected in this slide is that there's a varying <coughs> degree of true co-location between the GPS and the tide gauges. So um, in some cases, we have uh, GPS sites that are as much as 10 or 20 kilometers away from the <coughs> tide gauge. We had to make some kind of a, uh, of a cutoff as to what we would consider. Um, <coughs> But uh, so these are just velocity or the GPS velocities um, here are based on uh, the, um, you know, they're based on sort of standard rate, um, standard daily position solutions. So we're just lumping all the data together. Um, the, um, the, the quality of the sites on the East Coast is a little bit mixed. Um, there's a lot of building sites um, mounted on top on buildings. Um, the majority of those actually perform pretty well, but then there are definitely some that don't. So, so there's there's definitely a, a quality control. If you are um, using site sites, for feet. example, uh, the overall the noise level will be much better. What we did in this study, I didn't mention that, but we um, we used a colored noise model. When we did our velocity fit, so we're basically using a white plus flicker noise uh, model to get a more realistic uh, noise spectrum. And so uh, we are getting vertical velocities that are in the vicinity of 0 0.6, 0 0.7 millimeters per year um, for sites that have a long history. So, um, so that's, you know, that's, uh, I, I think in some cases, maybe down to about 0.5. It's hard to get much lower than that because of the colored noise component in the day. Uh, and those instruments or some of those instruments are have a, a clear sight. Do you know if they are, have a clear sight to the to the sea? So so uh, in this particular case I don't know. Um, some of them actually do uh, what you could take a look at. Um, um, I mean Christine Larson's portal that she's still got running mm -hmm. uh, might have identified uh, some of those. Many of these sites do not actually see the water. So um, so the majority of these sites are actually located near the tide gauge, not truly at the tide gauge, and not in a place where, where you would have direct um, measurement of, of the water. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Jeff. Very nice talk. Thanks. Um, I have a question on the pole seismic deformation. Uh, what, can you explain the, the difference between after slip and uh, viscoelastic uh, relaxation? Sure. Okay, so um, I have a figure to do it uh, very easily, but um, so uh, so the the um, first of all the physical um, physical mechanisms uh, after slip is basically continued slip on the fault plane. So um, so what we see um, mostly after big earthquakes in terms of after slip is that the the deeper extension of the fault plane, down dip of the co-seismic rupture, uh, creeps uh, in a transient fashion for um, usually a few to several years uh, after, the, uh, after the earthquake. So, um, so that's, that's what afterslip is physically. Uh, viscoelastic relaxation uh, in the subduction zone case is dominated by um, viscoelastic relaxation within the mantle wedge. So basically relaxation of, of the co-seismic stress changes uh, uh, and it's dominated by the mantle wedge for uh, the subduction case. There is actually a um, contribution, uh, further contribution from the uh, mantle beneath the slab as well. So, so essentially everywhere that there's viscoelastic mantle and a significant stress change that's co-seismic, we'll see uh, some uh, flow of the mantle and that produces the deformation signal. Um, let's see. So if I go here, um, the present day, the red vectors here are the present day velocities. And these present day velocities are almost entirely um, the result of the viscoelastic relaxation of the mantle. And so, uh, so that is producing essentially a trenchward motion. So during the earthquake, the, um, all of these sites are all across southern Alaska moved seaward. And we have a continued seaward motion 
uh, that is slowly decaying away uh, towards zero. So uh, in the case of the 1964 um, earthquake, it will probably take, uh, I mean, it's been 50 years, uh, more than that now, uh, but it's probably going to take another uh, century or so before uh, those post-seismic signals completely decay away. Um, um, go ahead. Yeah, so, so anyway, so the, the, the spatial pattern we see in the horizontal uh, from viscoelastic relaxation is trenchward motion. Um, the spatial pattern we see in the vertical from viscoelastic relaxation is uplift uh, that is basically over the mantle wedge, essentially. Uh, but it, uh, so the red colored region here is uplifting, uh, but it's not uplifting very fast. Uh, and so, um, so, so mostly that's a horizontal signal uh, at the present day. Uh, whereas after slip, because it was on a, a part of the fault plane that was dipping a little more steeply than the coast seismic actually produces a lot of uplift. So, um, so after slip produces a large amount of uplift. And you might hear the dog in the background. Uh, uh, we're uh, approaching the point where um, where it's time to feed the dog. Um. <laughs> so, um, so you, so if I under, understand it correctly, both after sleep and po and post and viscoelastic relaxation should have the same polarity of motion. They, they actually the have a similar polarity in the horizontal, as it turns out. So. So after slip um, produces, I don't have a figure in the slides here to show that, but both of them actually produce a seaward motion. Um, could you hold on for just a minute? I'm gonna go feed the dog and I'll be back in about one minute. Oh, sure. Uh, so so I'll, I'll get sure. to your question in one minute. I guess this is the, this is the, our, our new Zoom era here. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, it seems that a dog is really punctual. He knows when to eat and when not. Very impressive. You're very impressive, <laughs> much better than people. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what happens in daylight savings, though? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask him what the viscosity is, is for that viscoelastic model, because that's a long time period, mm -hmm. a couple hundred years. Or Okay. All right. Sorry about that. But um, That's yeah, the dog has actually never been happier because I am her primary person as far as she's concerned. And I'm home all the time now. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, yeah, in terms of the horizontal motions, it turns out that um, for this particular uh, geometry of shallow dipping subduction, both after slip and viscoelastic relaxation both predict a trenchward or seaward motion horizontally. But, but they predict very different vertical patterns. And so the, in this particular case, because the slab dip is very shallow, uh, there's a very small uh, vertical uh, component to the viscoelastic relaxation and a much more substantial vertical component to the afterslip. So but still both predict uh, upward vertical motion, but it's just one, it's yes. the afterslip cost much more uh, uplift than the, than the, that's right. than that's the, right. uh, yeah. So in this particular case, the, the viscoelastic model, this is contours, the contours are in centimeters and this is contours of the total uplift over 35 years. So the total uplift over 35 years from viscoelastic relaxation was only on the order of about 15 centimeters. Mm -hmm. So uh, five millimeters per year averaged over that whole time period. Whereas the total uplift from uh, in the data here are up to about a meter, oh, and so I, hmm. um, and so the the after slip uh, um, vertical motions were several times larger than the viscoelastic uh, motions, and what that meant is we could come up with a we could rem we could as soon as we had a reasonable viscoelastic model we could actually subtract that out, and the errors in the model would only be at the couple centimeter level, which was comparable to, you know, less than the errors in the data. And so essentially, um, it was very easy to isolate the component due to after slip. 
I see. So do those two processes also happen at very different time scales? Maybe they obviously it happens um, immediately, whereas- Yeah, they do. And I think if you look at the Kodiak tide gauge, which is the one that has the uh, most immediate, um, uh, best uh, short-term data, um, much of this very, very rapid rise uh, in the first several years after the earthquake was due to afterslip. I see. And so then the, the slow, um, the afterslip is essentially gone today. There's, there's no, essentially no afterslip going on today, 50 years later. So it, it um, for this big earthquake, the afterslip uh, was dominantly in the first several years. I see. So yeah, you, the other way you could separate these would be in time. Uh, so, so again, the present day, um, the present day velocities have essentially no contribution from afterslip. So the present day velocities give us a way to constrain the mantle viscosity uh, because we don't have, you know, we don't really have sensitivity to the afterslip. Gotcha. All right, what was you. the viscosity that you used? Um, I, it's about three times 10 to the 19 Pascal seconds. Okay. That seems, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, it turns out, um, we've, uh, from this result, um, uh, GIA modeling in southern Alaska, and then we've also just got a paper that we're sending in on post seismic deformation from a couple of small earthquakes, the Craig earthquake in 2013 in southeast Alaska, and the Haida Gwaii uh, earthquake. Um, and um, all of those give uh, upper mantle basically asthenosphere viscosities on the order of two to three times 10 to the 19 Pascal seconds. So they're pretty consistent even with different mechanisms are actually giving pretty consistent um, uh, viscosity models. And that agrees with the unloading from the glacier, local glacier unloading? It does, yeah. So, so the local GIA, um, there's, um, the, the different models have different trade-offs. So um, the GIA models, um, both of them are sensitive. There's a bit of a trade-off with lithospheric thickness, but yeah. that doesn't trade off too badly with the uh, asthenosphere viscosity. The GIA models have a stronger trade-off between asthenosphere thickness and viscosity, um, whereas the post-seismic models aren't really sensing the bottom of the asthenosphere very well, so they don't really, they don't really, yeah, they, they don't really sense that, but they do sense the viscosity, and they they all basically agree within a factor of fifty percent or so. Okay. So I mean that's pretty good for viscosity because yeah. really, most things depend on the log of the viscosity. So. Right. So that's a pretty small uh, disagreement. And that gives you that 200 year time frame or whatever for the- Yeah, so the relaxation time is on the order of 20, 20 years, 25 years um, with that. Uh, and uh, the signal's big enough that it takes several relaxation times before it goes away completely. Okay. Huh. Any other questions? I guess with that, uh, we'll thank Jeff again for his thank you, Jeff. great talk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank and you, Jeff. We, yeah, my you. Somebody will have to send me a picture of the beach. <laughs> 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 and uh, we hope to see everyone here next week for Tianzin's talk. It'll be same time, 1230. Um, and it'll be announced on the typical emails for those of you guys who aren't part of the IGPP. Uh, it'll be posted on that. Uh, Scripps website that Ignacio mm -hmm. yeah. put on.